Hey guys, welcome back to another week of Behind and Beyond. This week, I sit down with Amanda Beggs and we have a great discussion about her message from Sunday about Jesus at the wedding at Cana. We talk about all kinds of things and some topics you can expect, or we talk about Jesus and his authority in our lives and what it looks like to accept his lordship in times when we might not really feel like it. We talk about how we can bring our anxiety and the things that are stressing us to Jesus and how he cares about them specifically. And we have a little bit of fun talking about those practical ways to make our mealtimes more memorable and less of just a thing that we check the box on. So let's get into the conversation. Well, welcome back, Amanda. I'm so glad to have you here. So fun. This is great. So fun to have you here. It just feels like a normal conversation for us. We just happen to be being recorded. So we can what talk a dream. All day. We yes, really, we dream. truly could. Yeah, we're going to have to <laughs> I'm gonna keep on keep on track here. Um, so glad to have you back. Uh, fun fact people might not know is we had a little schedule swap. Yeah, I was supposed to uh, teach John Riley's week. The same passage, but that week, and I got the flu super bad, and John was amazing, stepped in. I think he got the call on Wednesday to see if he'd preach that weekend. No way. And yeah, amazing. Wow. So thankful. You would never know. John. No, and for our teaching team, and just that we're all there to support each other. So yeah, that I is... was back into the land of the living this week and ready. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I know that sermon. really wiped you and your whole family yeah, out. Yeah, it was rough. It was not I mean, fun. Tis the season though, I guess for everyone. Tis so. the season. How's everyone now? Good. We're good. We are just praying our way through every day that we stay healthy and can maybe make it through the rest of February. Wow. wow. So now that does that mean you sat with this material a lot longer mm-hmm. Than usual, I guess. Yes. So was there anything, um, I'm sure there was a lot that you, you had that extra week to sit with it. What was something that you really wanted to share that maybe you didn't get to or something you did share that you are, were just thought was really awesome that God revealed to you? I think for me, one of the biggest takeaways, just as a general takeaway, is there is so much packed into, it was 11 verses and a really familiar story. I think if you've grown up in the church, you know, you know about the miracle of Jesus turning water into wine, but I had no idea how much was in there. And I think it's really instructive, even as a reminder for myself to dig in, to not just, I think even when we do our Bible in a year plans or whatever we read and the things we've read before, or think we know we just gloss over, but it was really a challenge to approach it in a new way and see, okay, what, what is all the depth we can mine from this passage and there was so much more, even than what I could share. The Gospel of yeah. John is amazing. Just he's an incredible writer. All of the connections and layering, and really landing on a few specific themes. And I think a big takeaway was, you know, we're talking about the series meals and Jesus. And so my original temptation was to approach this like, well, what does this say about the meal? And it does. It, there's a lot, you know, that you can pull from the wedding itself, but really approaching it, what does this have to say about Jesus and going from there? And and so that was just a fresh reminder to me, especially reading the gospels leading up to Easter, like to always begin with that question, what does this have to say about Jesus? And then the floodgates open of everything that you can pull from it. Mm, Yeah, that's really good. I love the Jesus feeds and fills. I think that was a great take on, um, we had talked about before how there's a temptation to keep this series just in hospitality. Mm-hmm. And I like how you offered a fresh shake of what does it look like for Jesus to feed and fill us? And what's the difference in those? Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people hear that and they're like, aren't those the same thing? Like what's the, yeah. what's the nuance there? And I think you did a really good job of laying Thanks. that out. Yeah. So when you were talking about Jesus and how he feeds and fills, um, you had a lot of different ways. And one of them was about how Jesus feeds specifically mm-hmm. in this story. Um, something that I loved was that reminder of since Jesus feeds specifically, he can feed and fill those things that are specific in our lives. Mm-hmm. But so often we don't bring the thing that's stressing us out to us. So you asked a really great question for us to ponder of what are you stressing about that you haven't brought to him and why haven't you brought that to him? So my, I guess my question to your question is why do you think we hold back on those things, not bringing them to the Lord, asking really for myself? That's something I like really tend to just sit in my own stress. Yeah, we all do. And I think for one thing, it's easy to just think we've got it. Like even though we're stressed about it, we'd rather just think about it over and over again and worry about it. And it almost seems childish. I think of my kids and how they pray and they pray 
about anything and mm, everything. Yeah. And sometimes it can even be like, why are you, why are you praying for that? But they're <laughs> so quick to believe that Jesus cares about those things. And Jesus wants us to approach him with that childlike faith. And yeah. I think that would be bringing him anything. I had an example just two weeks ago in my own life. I have a friend who's going through a really difficult situation. And I've just thought about her a lot and been praying for her, but haven't been quite sure, you know, we had trying to connect on the phone. She lives out of state and I didn't want to push or, I don't know, make her talk to me, I yeah, guess. Hard. And I wasn't sure what to do. And I was just washing dishes one day and I was like, okay, God, I don't know if I'm supposed to reach out, if I'm just supposed to keep texting her encouragement. Again, a small, silly thing. Like in the big scheme of life, this is not a huge thing. And literally five minutes into that prayer, washing dishes, I pick up my phone and this person had texted me and said, hey, do you have a couple minutes to talk right now? I happen wow. to be free. And it was such wow. <laughs> a faith builder for me. And it's yeah. so silly and it's so small. But that conversation was also so rich and important and good. And for me, it was God just saying, like, I see you bring those things to me and I will show you that I am in the details. And so I think it's a discipline of that idea of praying without ceasing is really God, here's what's on my mind and I'm bringing it before you. We have no more wine. What should mm, I do? Yeah. And letting him speak into that. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, I think it's a great reminder too of like he already knows these things and it's prayer is that invitation. Like it's not, it's not about God doesn't need us to remind him. It's mm -hmm. like prayer is the act of us getting to engage with him. Yes. And it's like that invitation to why don't you bring this to me and see me build your faith in a situation like that. Absolutely. And we are so quick to bring, like I think about my relationship with Brad, I spew to him about anything. You oh, know, all same. these random Real details. verbal processors. Exactly. Yes. Real verbal <laughs> processors. Exactly. So yes. like from what we're going to have to dinner and I can't figure that out to something that happened at work that day to, you know, logistics with the kids. But that intimacy and relationship, like that's what you do with people you're close to. You're just always processing, yeah. especially for us verbal processors, yeah. right along with them. And I just think that that kind of faith can unlock something in our relationship with Jesus. Um, going off of that, thinking about Jesus, like filling our specific needs. I think a lot of times we want him to fill those needs, but we don't want the Lordship on the other mm -hmm. side of it. Uh, how do you combat those two in your own life or how have you seen it in others? Yeah, it's tough. That idea of living in the tension between Jesus here is my need, but then also being surprised or disappointed when he doesn't respond as quickly or in the way that I had hoped that can be a really tough space to live. And certainly in, in smaller things, I think we can just move on. But in the, the bigger longings of life, that can be really hard. And I think about Mary, I, she's just such a fascinating biblical character to me. And what she would have had, even in that moment, maybe that would cause her to double down on that faith. She had the word from the angel. She knew who Jesus was promised to be. And she had lived about 30 years with Jesus at that point as her son. And seeing his character and just who he would have been as an incredible man and person and son. And so I think for us in those moments of tension, when it's difficult to submit, it's going back to the, the word who God says that Jesus is and he is and what those promises are that we can stand on. And then his character, how we've seen him come through again and again. And for me, it's I have to literally rehearse to myself going back like, the same situation where I wanted something and Jesus didn't answer in the way that I had hoped. This is how he was faithful in that even more than I could have yeah. planned out in my own mind. And so he will be again. And so just yeah. drawing from what you know to be true about Jesus. And I have to imagine, you know, we don't know, but I imagine that that's a lot of what was informing Mary's faith at that point. Yeah. I love that doubling down aspect. You touched on that too, that I think it's easy to read that story and you can miss that when Mary looks at the servants and says, do whatever it is he tells you. You had that point about how she didn't understand Jesus, but instead of being, you know, saying, you know, to her son, like rightly, like, hey, what are you doing? You know, she um, accepted his lordship. And instead she turned and said, okay, I don't understand, but I'm going to go even deeper into this faith and tell you to just do whatever it is he tells you. Yeah, I love that. And I, you just imagine the scene, and she says that, and then what he tells them is something so bizarre. Oh, so out of left field, yeah. So it, she's probably like, okay, what, 
what? Like, and you know, I'm sure the servants were in the same way. And so even, even when you begin to see Jesus act sometimes, I think we can be like, what? Like this, yeah. this isn't, where is this going? But then seeing how he works it out and brings it to good and for the good of the couple that didn't even know about it is pretty amazing. One illustration I really like that you use on Sunday was from Jesus feeling abundantly and you held up that wine glass and showed that we can walk around with a glass half full mentality, but what would it look like for that to be a glass that's overflowing mentality? Mm -hmm. Um, What does that look like for you to be fully filled with the Lord? And how do you get to that place of overflowing when it's not easy? That's a great question. And for me, that point of abundance and half full versus overflowing was probably the biggest personal takeaway because it's so easy to know things and allow them to sort of fill us, but then we still have all of these indicators that, no, I'm actually looking to be filled all of these other places. And for me, what it looks like to be half filled, and I mentioned this a little bit in the sermon, is to live under that fear of man. Like, what are other people going to say? How are they going to respond to that? Did this meet someone's expectations or approval or, and still looking for that gap in the glass to be filled by what they're saying and, I think it's just identifying that that's, I'm not living out of the fullness in that moment. I'm not living like what an incredible life it would be to not worry about the opinions of other people or their approval or applause yeah. or, and that's a life that Jesus offers us. And so to come back to your question, how do you practically live into that? I think for one, it just starts with identifying I am living a glass half full faith because yeah. I can point to these other places where I'm trying to fill, you know, I want my career to fill that or I want a relationship to fill that or whatever it might be and identifying that first and then just going back to scripture and just asking the Lord to allow those truths to really catch fire in you so that they become something that you are banking on, that you're standing on and living in that reality instead of just knowing it, I think mm. to live it out is, is really different and it takes time. And I think it's two steps forward, one step back. Yeah, You know, I can make progress in that area and then someone will say something and maybe it really stings or cuts. And, and then I have to identify like, no, I'm not living out of the fullness. And I just wonder how different life would be if we lived from that glass overflowing mm. place. That's really good. Do you think there are things that we like have to take out as well? Like, Hmm. is there like you add things in and you take things out that you're like lies you're believing or? Yeah, that's a great way to think about it. Like an emptying before. Yeah, I literally just thought that. I don't know. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, I think so. And I think absolutely, because if you want to just keep going with the glass analogy where, you know, the wine is Jesus filling us halfway and then there's that gap that we're filling with other things. I do think we, there's a dismantling of, I don't need to fill myself with these things. And sometimes it's a, Emptying is obviously confession and repentance and saying, Lord, I'm sorry that these things are what I've been turning to to fill me. You know, please just cleanse me of that need, you know, for the fear of man and and bring it down. I also think there's a practical piece of if you know that there's something that you're chasing after that's filling you, attempting to fill you, then stop chasing after it. And so Mm. if there's certain people whose approval you're dying for, then stop going to that person for approval. Or if it's, you know, just things, material possessions, you don't want my kitchen to look a certain way or my house to look a certain way, then get off Instagram and stop looking at all the ways you could be filling that need or whatever it is. I think there's a conscious obedience that comes from that emptying. So yes, I do think to really allow Jesus to fill us is to empty ourselves of those Mm. things both before him and then practically. I thought the performance and measuring up mentality is something that stays with us throughout all of life. Mm -hmm. And it was so true what you said, like you're in middle school or high school, you can think, oh, like adults don't deal with this, but (laughs) spoiler, it never really goes away. No, never. Yeah. But it's a very, um, it's a thing that we can practically work through and get better at of not being filled by the things of this world and the things of man. And, but instead when you're filled up, like you're saying by the things of God and when Jesus is fully satisfying then you're not looking elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But I think it's easy when you're stuck in that pattern to just think this is it. I'm always going to feel this way. And the freedom, that's why that idea of filling and freedom really go hand in hand because thinking 
I, even for me personally, the exercise of thinking what it would look like to live as a glass overflowing person, like that life is so appealing. It's so free. I, don't, I can forgive people and I don't have yeah. to be easily offended. And I'm not always chasing after someone's approval or a promotion or whatever it might be like that life would be abundant, joyful and rich and full, just, you know, like this, that symbolism of wine. And so I think sometimes it's, it's putting that in front of ourselves too. Like I could have this, in fact, this is what Jesus died for us to have. This is what that new covenant life looks like. Yeah. And to only be living halfway into that. It's just, that's not the fullness that he offers. Yeah. And freed people are, no, filled, filled people are, are free, free people. people. That was it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you got it. And that freedom too is what we are inviting people into mm-hmm. when we bring them around our tables. Absolutely. And I think it's easy to lose sight of the big picture and think, oh, okay, I need to be hospitable because that's what Jesus did. But it's like, no, we have like life in abundance mm-hmm. and eternity is on the table mm-hmm. quite literally when we invite people into it. Yes. So it adds a real weight to it, it which does. I love. And they get a taste of that. I think when we invite people into our homes and especially when we allow them to peek behind the curtain and see where things are hard or flawed or messy, but yet for them to still see that there's that abundant life, that there's that joy and grace and life flowing out of us. Yeah. They do get a taste of like, wait a second, they're not so concerned with the things I'm so concerned about. And yet they're so full. Their lives are so full. What is that? Mm -hmm. And there's only an aspect that people will see that if we let them in literally to our homes and into the mess and kind of just day to day of our lives. Yeah. One thing I think everyone could relate to on Sunday was the great example of that Chick-fil-A drive through run with your kids and, you know, the urge to just throw the bags in the back seat, keep going. Um, But how uh, so many times, like the people in our lives want those memorable moments around the table mm-hmm. instead of just being fed. Um, what are some ways we could make our mundane moments more memorable versus just practical? Yeah, great question. I know a lot of times when I feel the pressure to make them meaningful, I translate that as it has to be like wonderful or cost a lot of money or yeah. have a lot of crafts or be really special or something like that. And those things are great, but meaning really just comes from intentionality. So it can be as simple as we went to a dinner with friends a couple of weeks ago and the people hosting the dinner just had really meaningful questions that they asked and had everyone go around and share. And that sounds mm. maybe a little bit cheesy, but it was some of the best conversation we've had with other couples in a long time, but it was because they took the thought or they took the time ahead of time to think of just one or two meaningful questions. Yeah. Something else would be, you know, when was the last time you had a meal with your spouse as opposed to just eating with your spouse? Like really intentional, good Mm -hmm. conversation beyond just the mundane, like daily checklist of life. It was just that level of intentionality that I'm going to make this more than just a time to eat together. I'm going to, you know, honor someone at the table. Like what does everyone, why do you, why do we love Rebecca? And let's go around and say that. Like just those really simple things Super easy. Don't cost anything. Don't take any time. They just take intentionality. And we'll just tease out a little resource that's coming to the Northway app this weekend, actually. Just kind of five different scenarios of ways that you might host people in your house and resources and ideas of how to do just that, how to make it more than just a time of eating together and being fed, but really a time of being filled. And so I think there's what, like a pizza party and Taco a night bonfire. We yes. got a brunch. We have lots of things. So many fun yeah. things. A dinner party. Yes. So yes. like, the, and that will have resources for yeah. kids and adults and just ideas of way to make it meaningful. And sometimes all we need is a little spark of an idea. So that's really the intention behind that resource. And it'll be on our app starting this weekend. I think it's a great way to just take a next step beyond giving someone food and really allowing them and inviting them into a meal. As we start to wrap up, um, would love to know from you the question we always like to end with um, because it just brings us back to what really matters. Uh, From studying this material, what have you learned and seen that has led you to know, experience, and follow Jesus more because of it? There was so much, honestly, with this sermon that, that did that to know, experience, and follow Jesus more deeply. But I think the reminder, kind of just to go back with where we started on that focus on who Jesus is. Like when you see that Jesus 
cares about the details of our lives and is working on our behalf and is making a way, made a way for us not to have to live under some religious system and is filling us with his abundance. Jesus is so appealing and you want to know him more and experience that life that he offers. And so I think just a big personal takeaway is to really approach the scriptures with that question. Like, what does this say about Jesus? And the more I know about Jesus and the more I see him, even at a wedding in a social situation, which is such a fun way to think about Jesus, the more I'm drawn to him because he really Mm. is that amazing, not to sound cheesy, but just when he becomes the hero in the spotlight in the way that we're interpreting scripture, we're drawn to him. Yeah. And so that's, you know, whatever the story is or the gospel account that we're reading, if we can approach it like that, mm. we'll grow in our intimacy with Jesus. Mm. That's good. What a way to end it. Well, thank you for your time. Yeah, it was Amanda. great to be here. Always fun. We love it. Um, thank you guys for listening, for watching. Uh, we hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.